That means anybody can vote for any party person. You can have two or three Democrats be, uh, two Democrats could be in the second highest vote, could be two Republicans, could be two independents. In other words, just the, the one and two, that's who gets over there. It, it's set up to exclude third voices, right. third parties. Right. But the other side of it is we gotta make it go to our advantage too. It's set up to, to exclude us, but at the same time, we need to make it uh, meaningful for us. Can we be the second highest vote? Right now, I'm asking everybody, including brown people who like brown, vote for me because you just don't want Tim Donnelly. See what I'm getting at? Yeah. And then I'll challenge Brown, and if I can't properly challenge him, fine, vote for Brown in November. But the point is, I think I can. I think we can challenge all these candidates. I think we're the best ones that can do it. So I think that's the issue now in the next nine days. Even if you love Brown, even if you love, you know, Newsome, whatever it might be. <laughs> Make sure that he gets challenged properly by people who have these issues and are not gonna back down. That to me is what's important. Well, I just want to talk about the, the scale problem of California. Because when you run a statewide campaign, when you attempt to run a statewide campaign in, in the nation state of California, it's a scale issue. Um, and even if somebody like me, let's say I have $10 million, well, I, I still couldn't buy enough TV coverage to cover the entire state, even with $10 million. So what you do is you create stunts. Uh, you get verbally abusive, you go on tirades, you uh, drive trucks into buildings, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and you only hate that. You do. Um, <laughs> Stop the cameras. <laughs> you do. And what, what my company advisor tells me that is called stunts. You, you do stunts. And, and stunts are scalable. Uh, because the blogs and the you know parasites take hold of that and they run with it. So so that's one way you scale up your message uh, to a nation state of California. Uh, the me getting angry with the receptionist at Sacramento Press Club has gone global. So so you do a stunt. Um, that's one one thing you can do. The other is you buy ads. Okay. Right now, the cheapest ad that's scalable, unfortunately, are um, robocalls. Um, I personally hang up on them, so I haven't, I haven't bought a single robocall. Uh, although every every cottage industry crook in the world has been trying to sell me robocalls. Um, so the other type is online ads. Okay, you can do an online ad for about twenty bucks a day, and three people see it. Um, because Mark Zuckerberg wants all the money, so he's filtering the research results. So you're only seeing 1% of the content on Facebook from your friends. And so if you want to see more than 1% of the content, on, that's why I'm deleting all my Facebook um, If you want to see more than that, I don't want to monopolize the time, but um, you have to pay. So the more money you pay, in theory, the more people are allowed to see your dumb ad, you know, your review. <laughs> And so what I'm doing is uh, Twitter, I'm just using only Twitter, and now they're remodeling Twitter to be like Facebook, so they're going to wreck Twitter too. Um, and then, and then um, I, went to the, I went to the colleges to get my signatures to sign up for the race, and I went to many, many colleges, um, and then I've been approached by high schools to write papers that never materialized. So there were three or four high school writers that maybe have articles out there that might happen someday after the election. Um, but yeah, but it's a scale issue. Um, when I started to run, I thought I'd have five to six million dollars. Um, I, I leaked that information. That's why I'm getting coverage, folks, because people thought I was going to buy a buttload of ads. Um, the media, the you know, LA Times wanted me to buy an ad on the cover of the paper, a piece of paper that goes over the paper, and some Dave Curtis, you know? I leaked two years ago that I would have five to six million dollars. Um, then, and be, well, it, and I was going to have five to six million dollars. I was in an active lawsuit. Um, then, when I filed, I I cut it down. I said, oh, I'll have about a hundred thousand initially, and I, I reasonably expected to have a hundred thousand. That's this is all insider baseball, by the way. But oh well. Um, I thought I'd have 100,000 because guess what? We have 100,000 greens, and I thought, oh, they'll each throw in a buck. Yeah. Guess how much I've raised today? 
twelve dollars. Eight gram from a hundred thousand greens. How many greens do you think that is? Sixty-seven. Okay. Half of them out of state. <laughs> I think there's a third way. And, 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 and let me say real quick, I think there's a third way, and that is to grassroots where people have been missing all this time. I think it's totally, wholly undemocratic and forcing people to have to do it. And I, the only way that I see it is to go out in those communities, talk to people, get out there, and do it. We, when we did the petition drive, we did it grassroots. We had to. We got 5,000 signatures. That's not what they want. They want 10,000, but 5,000, a lot of young people went out, it's pretty good. And I think that's why you build on, you build on that. We have all this great video, people are doing it for free because they believe in what we're doing. And so in other words, I think you gotta have a message and a connection and people gotta say, you're worth it. I'm seeing all these young people, uh, we, the coordinating body we have in LA, there are all these young people and they are dudes and they're putting, and they're working two or three jobs, they're going to school and they're, they're here helping. So my thing is grassroots connect. The Salinas thing is a big connection. We did the Ellis Act thing here in San Francisco. That was a big important connection. We did uh, the 13 um, year old Andy Lopez in Santa Rosa. Yeah, we were there more than once to talk to the family, talk to the, <coughs> the people there. So that's the other way, just get out there organized grassroots work, whether they'll give us all the numbers we need this time around, and these and lays the groundwork for us to keep building, even if we don't get it this time around, but we keep building towards something. Well, I think ideally the campaigns would be both, but each of the campaigns would be both of us. Can I say something, just regarding a local campaign? L Linda was, I think, well, so, right. sorry. Well, okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks, I just, I just wanted to say that there are examples I mean, I think that we need to feed ourselves with examples of hope. And people always tell me, well, hope has gotten a bad name, you know. But, <laughs> but that, that's, you know, their problem. We actually, I think hope is an essential human nutrient. But in the political realm, what is the biggest city in the country with a Green Party mayor? Richmond. 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 Okay. And my favorite election ever of all time was Richmond in 2010, where Chevron put a million dollars against three candidates, and they were all no corporate money candidates. They did grassroots campaigns, and mm -hmm. the, and Chevron lost, lost, and lost mm -hmm. a million bucks into three city council uh, races. And the other thing is that Latin America, if the truth were told about Latin America, everybody would know that it is possible for, and it was especially the young, and this is my Venezuelan flag, um, that, that Hugo Chavez, Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez. The, the real deal. And, and sometimes people cannot believe that a politician <coughs> can actually be real, not perfect but can be committed and be on the side of people, and that was Hugo Chavez and there's other people as well. Nicholas. And one of the brilliant, Nicholas Maduro, but one of the brilliant things that, um, that Hugo Chavez led and a lot of other people in, in Latin America was the integration and the solidarity among countries. So they had solidarity among people and solidarity among countries, and their health care is improving Education is improving, participation in the government is increasing, the disparity of wealth is decreasing. It's phenomenal, and the, what made a huge difference, it wasn't a violent um, revolution, it was an electoral revolution, and the people who came out to vote were the young and the impoverished. And they got, Hugo Chavez always got plenty of media in Venezuela, it was all bad. Calling, calling him a monkey, a dictator, you know, all sorts of really horrible things because of who owns the media there. But, so it's possible at the huge scale of country and even continent, and it's possible at the scale of city, and we're just keeping on tilling the soil and doing whatever it, we can do, but we're not waiting for the 1% to change the rules in our favor. The 1% has three things they want us to do in election time. Their favorite, don't vote. That's why they spend so much time trying to get people not to vote. And the second and third, vote Democrat, vote Republican, they bought, up, bought them, you know, the billionaires, you can't buy enough jet, jets and islands, you gotta buy power. 
So they buy media and they buy politicians, and I almost think the worst thing in our electoral system is how cheap politicians are. <laughs> so they bought them all. But not this group, and there are others too. There are Greens, and there are the <laughs> side of San Francisco, the Sunset and the Richmond Papers, and I decided that I was going to ask him how much does it cost to put a quarter page color ad in your paper, and he gave me a deal. And not only that, but he gave me entree to a brand new paper in the Haight District, and that was put out for the first time this month. I ended up calling another paper out of the Bayview just because I, I know the editor of the Bayview paper. Say, hey, how much would you charge me to put a quarter page ad in the paper? And then I called the Central City Extra, which covers this whole area in the Tenderloin, and they deliver to City Hall. I had a quarter page ad in their paper. And so, and all of that maybe cost me eleven to $1,200. Each one of those papers is putting out 15 to 18 to 20,000 copies now, yeah, a lot of that ends up being on, on people's doorsteps. They don't open it up, but a lot do open up. And there's at least some media exposure. And it begins a relationship with those small papers that perhaps in the future they'll actually write something about us. So, you know, the, the small neighborhood newspapers, they are very accessible. For two to three hundred dollars, you can have 20,000 pieces of lit on people's door fronts. This is something that is very doable. And if we don't have the volunteers to get this stuff all around, well, they're paying people to go and distribute these papers. It's, it's good. So let's uh, move on, Ethan. Uh, yeah, just first a um, couple of <laughs> things. So um, first of all, well, you may know the Guardian's been bought out by the same people who bought the Examiner. That's right. why their behavior has changed. Um, as far as the French uh, tax the rich, um, yeah, I'm basically on the same page, but to play devil's advocate, because other people will when you get in tougher rooms, there's been a lot of, there have been problems with that, like uh, companies moving to Italy and rich people leaving, and um, in the last election in France that just happened, the National Front fascists won 25 percent of the seats, which is not saying it's because of the rich tax, but... Yeah, I think uh, it's because of the EU, they're, they're all your, your own things. Mm -hmm. Can you finish your sentence? Uh, well, I just saw that today, that, that France had gone, it was socialist and it's gone, I saw fascist. conservative, but okay, fascist. Well, parts of it. <laughs> yeah. Because they're very, un or in fact, all across the Eurozone, that's the way the elections are going, because they're very unhappy with, with the Euro and with, well, my particular interest, they just imposed a banking union in March where um, there is a three pillared uh, deal. So you have bailouts, bail ins, and supposedly deposit insurance, but they didn't agree on the deposit insurance. So they're required by law uh, if one of these 130 major banks goes bankrupt. First, they can tap into this bailout money that all the countries have contributed, but first, they have to bail in their creditors' money, which means their shareholders, their bondholders, and their depositors. The largest class of creditor of any bank is their depositor. So they actually legally are required to take their depositors' money to recapitalize themselves. Now, theoretically, they're protected by deposit insurance, but they didn't pass the deposit insurance part. So the depositors are going to get screwed when, when one of those banks goes down. Like Cyprus. Like Cyprus. 
Yeah, so, and that's just one, I mean, that's the thing that I'm the most familiar with, but I think in general, they're very unhappy with the, the Troika, you know, it's the IMF, the, the ECB, and then the <coughs> European Commission that are, that are, it's like bankers that are running, running the Eurozone, not, not, it's not people, and it's not social issues, it's banking issues. Good answer. So, Danny is next. Thank you very much. I watch a lot of television uh, from uh, Europe, and, uh, and I, I watch the Green Party, and the Green Party's been moving up very steadily throughout Europe and the Eurozone. The Green Party has actually overtaken many of the other parties, and uh, some of the leftist parties in Germany now have the right to actually create foundations in which they can fund the development of uh, political opinions not in agreement with the federal government of Germany. So. So things are moving that way in the United States. This Green Party, I think, is very critical to me as an American Indian. With the Green Party, I think that's the hope that I have in my eyes, in my elders' eyes, for the future of the world. So the Green Party is, in, in the consciousness of my future, it is the future of the world. So that's how I think about the Green Party. In, in terms of how I look at this, I look at the Green Party as it, it, like a seed. You know, the seed that grows from the earth and the seed that comes up and makes the tree and makes the fruit. Well, the fruit of us, of course, is our children. And uh, without education, we can never have the growth of the seed. And I look at this very importantly because I, I read the, uh, the, the uh, environmental working group analysis of uh, Ken Wall, who stated that uh, his child was born and uh, they, they analyzed the umbilical cord of the child. And in that umbilical cord, there were 300 chemicals. But in 1491, when they met the Indians, which is our ancestors, there were seven chemicals in the body. Now there's 300, of which the majority are carcinogenic. So what kind of seed is that? What kind of seed are we growing in this country? And then I look at the way in which education becomes important, because maybe the generation that we look at as the generation of the future is now five years old or seven years old or ten years old. You know, they are smarter than we are because they can accept things. They don't have the politics of filtering, the politics of denigration and predatory corporate Can I have control. A question? Now we have now we have the process of making us very important. So the question is the Green Party, will the Green Party bring these things forward? Will the Green Party educate all of us? and will the Green Party make us a part of this whole system. We are the alternative, we are the alternative to all these things. There's nothing wrong with the media not liking us. There's, that is an acknowledgement of the correctness of the process and the path. What, what is wrong is that we haven't got the education of the young, and it doesn't take us a, a lot of work to go back to our children and tell them these are the things that are gonna happen. Just like in Europe, it grew very small. It'll grow here too. It's right, and it's on the right path. So I know that this this party is the party of the future. So, so maybe I'd like to congratulate them and say thank you very much. From, uh, thank you. Anybody <laughs> thank want you. To me, it's very obvious that that is very true, for, true, for, and I do think that I would personally make it clear to people that what I do is really based on indigenous. Cosmology, I believe in it. I read the Green Party the California platform and it's got that in there. This is why I support the Green Party because it has that indigenous native thinking in there, whether you know it or not, it's in there. But one of the things that's very important, I will be going to Germany in July to study what's going on over there. I'm seriously trying to do something big in the state of California and the Green Party has got to think that way. We got to think big. We got to think what's possible, not what isn't possible. We got to think what, what the possible is that exists in people, not what doesn't exist in them. We got to think that we're going to change what is happening because what is happening isn't working for anybody. So I totally think the future is, the seed is being planted. There is a future here. But one thing I will have to say to all of you, being Green Party members and the Green Party member, we're going to have to change the composition of this Green Party. And I'm going to tell you because I love you guys, not because I hate you. We gotta change the composition of the Green Party. It's gotta look like the people in the state of California. It's gotta incorporate all the people from the state of California. It's gotta be 
like those people in Salinas, just like those people in East Oakland, just like those people that are being pushed out of these uh, uh, Ellis Act things in San Francisco. It's kind of look like this is California, this is America, and it's kind of incorporated. So I would just say that that's what I'm for. This is what I'm fighting for. And that's the challenge. We're at the crossroads. Can we take it through and make it what it is? Everybody's ideas is amazing. The thinking that people have in the Green Party is probably the best thinking anywhere. But now can we incorporate that thinking into people's lives? That to me is the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. tribal law, as well as advocacy. So personally, myself, I can I plan to continue uh, on that path and learn more and, and really just trying to advocate and get into light the injustices that are going on, even to this day. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just say quickly, one thing about in Europe, the Green Party actually has a voice at the table. I mean, they actually have a system where the minority parties can get elected and get some representation. And here we have a system that is obviously more and more geared towards squeezing everybody out but the big corporate parties who are basically the same party. So that's why we get some representation. I just want to go ahead. Yeah, um, also quickly is that that's where, and I think Louise mentioned it, like we have to take the opportunities that they are. The 1% is, they're not going to change the rules in our favor, except occasionally by accident. <laughs> but but the, um, the top two has that feature. So there are lots and lots of terrible things about the top two primary, but any voter can vote for any candidate. There's absolutely no reason for people not to vote. And if they don't want to vote in every race, if all it is is the Democratic Republican Party running, don't vote in that race. Vote, but vote in races where there are Green Party candidates and Peace and Freedom candidates because we don't take corporate money. And it's like a young friend of mine in an Occupy panel a couple of years back said that as his mother said, she said, always vote. It's the least you can do. Just don't make it the only thing you do but use every bit of power that you have. And the one person is absolutely aware of how powerful our vote is because they've done the math. 99% beats 1%. So that's... <laughs> yeah, I just want to say, I'm from Nevada originally, so um, all of what was defined as Nevada was native roaming land, the whole thing, uh, and one of the most inhospitable places on the planet. Um, for humans. Um, and then the military occupation began, and to this day, uh, you know, most of the bulk of Nevada is uh, Bureau of Land Management, and then approximately 33% of Nevada is militarized zone where they, um, you know, they tested the atom bombs and the nuclear bombs, and they still, they do still do subcritical testing to this day. In Nevada. So Subcritical. Yeah, and, it, and now they've proposed and then unproposed Yucca Mountain and then they rebranded it and now they're temporarily storing you know, nuclear waste. So um, there's a lot of scars uh, in Nevada specifically and I, I you know, got fed up with the mafia basically and left, left Nevada um, and uh, into California. Um, so so the, those are my frames in terms of the you know, relationship of the Native Americans to this thing, and I'm not even to get into the issue of genocide. But let me just add something. Those immigrants that we talked about are Native peoples. Mm -hmm. And you've got to recognize that. I, I, I work with the Native American community, it's my community. I am not separating myself from them, you understand what I'm saying? My mother's Radamani from Chihuahua, Mexico. See, they were in this land, united with all the tribes in, the, in this land. When people start talking about a native population that's a small native American, they forget there's tens of thousands in the continent. And those immigrants that people are getting pissed off, they're not immigrants. They're going back to their own land. They're Mayan. Some of them are Oaxacans. They don't even speak Spanish. I want to make sure it's clear so people don't separate these things. My brother here, he looks like me. We're brothers. 
And we're bringing in that cosmology in there so people can see this is where we're going. This is the direction we're going. Now, it's not excluding anybody. However we got here, let's make this the best country in the world. Let's make this the best state in the world. See what I'm saying? However we got here, we're not excluding nobody. We're here now, and we're going to have to work together to make it work. But that cosmology has got to come back alive and be relevant for what we're going through now. Yeah. One, one, of the, one of the possibilities with what's going on um, is that as the material prospects for, for our opportunities for buying stuff, consumer, all of that stuff, as somebody was pointing out in one of the, one of the university newspapers, that people are talk about young people and they say, oh, all they care about are their electronics, they have these electronics, and they said, well, hey, you know, my parents' generation, all they wanted was a huge car, you know, and so they're just looking for little electronics. But the, but the getting so many, as the material stuff prospects reduces, our appreciation of art and music and getting together and dance and that kind of thing can actually grow. And I know my daughter's in a band, but she's not the only daughter that's in a band. <laughs> so there, there are a lot of, of young people who are really um, learning. It's almost like getting to that cosmology, you know, to that important spiritual, the things that make us human. Because the material stuff that make us machines is becoming less available to us, and we're looking to other, um, other options which are actually more human. <coughs> Sandra is next. Um, what I wanted to end you was uh, people are getting really frustrated because they're trying to get on the staff, and so I just wondered if you wanted to take a few minutes and uh, you know get people's names so that you've got them to call on. Okay, the, the people I have right now are Sandra, Sherry, uh, Alana, Lee. Um, what is it, Julia? Julia. Juliana. And can we limit these to questions rather than testimonies yeah. from the audience? Greg. Greg. There's a couple more. Some behind you. Say your names. Rich. Rich. Yeah. I'm also Greg. Greg. Greg too. Greg too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was suggested, let me limit it to questions. Questions? Sir, sure. yeah. didn't you have your hands up, sir? Yeah. 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 So he wants to be on the list. You're in his own stick. Yep. So Andy, I'm in the stack. I'm just going to take a couple minutes. And I'm, I'm not asking you a question. I, I want to ask them a question. And that is, I mean, are these six of the most fantastic people that you've ever <laughs> seen? <laughs> Chevron to not pay for 
the drilling, for taking our oil, and for raising our prices. I'd like to hear some solutions that are very specific about addressing that issue. I hear, prop, I'm tired of hearing Prop 13, I'm sorry. Why are we not addressing the corporations? Um, prop 13 will come, but you know, I want to hear what's happening to the Chevrons, the privileged class of this, who are um, who singularly take the vital resources, create the create the devastation to our environment, and yet um, are declaring corporate uh, profits beyond our wildest dreams. Very okay, well, I have to jump in because uh, in Prop Thanks 13, more Prop 13. In Prop 13, <laughs> it was not all about real estate property taxes. It has one line in there that said that all decisions related to increasing revenue in the state shall be made by two-thirds majority of both houses of the legislature. So any oil severance tax, which every other place in the world, not just the country, has, cannot be voted in except for a two-thirds majority because that was voted in in 1978. Now that's just one reason that we don't have it. The second reason is that both parties are corporate financed. Because recently, the Democratic wing has had a two-thirds majority in both houses of the legislature in California, not to mention 100% of the statewide offices, which are governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general, controller, treasurer, insurance commissioner, public and you know, superintendent of public schools and both senators, 100% Democrat, and, to, and, and super majorities in the legislature, and they didn't vote that in. And there were people, I think Amiano was one, who wanted to, either Mark Leno or Amiano had these brilliant ideas to, uh, to make these changes, but they had to toe the line of Jerry Brown in order not to do it. So I'm sorry, but so it was two things. One is Prop 13 makes it easy. So the solution is to replace these people. What is your strategy for doing? I mean, I'm running for a lot of complaining and whining and stuff. Running for office. <laughs> well, I'm hearing some things like, oh, they want this media. I know all that. Please tell me your strategy. It's my turn. Here's what I heard. Um, gasoline is expensive. And it's costing you one day of your salary per week to get your job. Correct. All right. So that's an architectural problem. Um, one is, one is, gas is too expensive. The whole premise to fracking, I thought, in addition to wrecking the environment, is lower the gas price. Um, so apparently that wasn't true. Um, so there's a problem with the price point of gasoline domestically. Um, what, and what I've heard, the, excuse, the apology for that is, they're shipping it all internationally because they can get more money. Um, so it's artificially messing with the price point of gasoline. Okay, however, the gas merchants uh, just raise it lower however they want. It's a rack. The, the price point is a rack. And that's no reason why. It's just happening. Um, the second point is there used to be a thing called worker housing. And that means you worked here and you slept here. And they were adjacent. They were physically adjacent. Well, you know, they don't let you build anything in California. You can't build a freaking flag. They won't let us build anything because there's so much layer of bureaucracy and protectionism and regulation and just dysfunctional bribery going on that you cannot build in. So I would love, it's what I've done for 25 years, is to build houses. I would love to do that. California's probably the most toxic environment to try to build houses. Guaranteed possible. So, and you never even get started. So that's why you can't afford to live next to school in California. Um, but, but I think she's point, making a good point. We're just talking about the cost of it. I think that one of the principles that I have is there are vast resources to be given to The one principle is you align resources to me. You don't align resources to who's got the money. The problem with the whole market system, it goes to who can afford, they pay for these things. The mess that we're seeing is the fact that none of these resources are aligned to actual needs. For example, we're talking about the whole oil industry, but 
we're thinking about forget the oil industry, forget it entirely. Don't we got solar, air, water? Don't we got ways technologically to advance our efficient energy? We do have it. Yeah. Where is those resources and where is the money to build that? In fact, California pioneered many of them, except that again, corporations and the price point of the technology is coming down. So as, as the price point of the technology. Yeah, but, but, but let me explain what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at that we, if we get in there, we have to align all those resources to the needs of the state. We cannot have it any other way. This means you cannot have corporate control. This means you're challenging the whole, the whole thing. You're challenging the whole premise of the thing. You understand? If we don't go in there and challenge the whole premise, we're just going to be reforming, reconfiguring what they've already established. We got to say there's big needs in the state and there's big funding. Uh, that speed rail, really the high speed. Uh, high speed route. High speed route. It's actually in the long run going to be two hundred and three billion dollars by the time they finish it. Mm -hmm. That's something we can challenge. That's only going to serve two hundred thousand mostly business commuters. Yeah. So we there's things to challenge every step of the way. We can look at how come this is beginning to there. Another thing, Brown wants to propose ten billion dollars to the prison system. Ten billion dollars? I would say no. We would, that's what our place would be. No, no. Take that money away, put it back in our communities, put it back in our schools. There's ways to do all that if you have that principle. Um, my solution would be alcohol. You can for two hundred thousand you know, alcohol was before the autos. They, I mean, before gasoline, there were with alcohol and it was suppressed. That like prohibition supposedly was to suppress alcohol as an alternative as fuel. But for two hundred thousand dollars, a community can set up a still that you can feed all sorts of any kind of organic waste to the still. Apparently, if you the corn mash is actually better for the cows to eat the mash after it comes through the still, and then you get the alcohol and you can run all your you can you can run your community indefinitely for this two hundred thousand dollar investment, and you can get the two hundred thousand dollar investment from a state owned bank, let's say, or any sort of publicly owned bank that would just issue the credit. And you create the credit, all banks create the money they lend. Most people think they lend their deposits, they don't. What they lend is bank credit. So all you need is a bank.